Thank you so much, Sally. So as I said before, Dr. Sally Fryer, who is here to talk to us about marine and freshwater fungi. Thank you so much, Sally, for coming alongside. No problem at all. Thank you for inviting me. Um, always happy to talk about fungi with some fungi enthusiasts. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm a senior research fellow at Flinders University. Um, I'm in an honorary role there. Um, I mostly do research um, and have been researching marine and freshwater fungi for about 25 years now. Um, I do some teaching at Flinders Uni, but mostly I'm, I'm pottering around in the lab doing research. So what are marine and freshwater fungi, I hear you say? Uh, let me see. There we go. Um, so before I actually launch into what they are, I actually just wanted to take a step back and, and just put up, I've just got a couple of slides on um, the, the, the bigger picture of what fungi are. Um, some of you are probably really well versed in what fungi are, so you can just um, sit back and, and uh, take it easy for the next few slides. But I just thought I'd better go through this um, just to get um, people up to speed if they're not used to the fungi, the whole fungal um, kingdom. So what you're probably really used to are the basidium isetes. Um, these are the toadstools and mushrooms and <clears throat> the shelf fungi and all the big things that you'll see out in the forest. Sometimes you'll see um, some ascomycetes. You might see some little cups um, like this, um, particularly up in Queensland. You're really lucky up there. You get all sorts of beautiful things. Um, but if you look really closely on um, some of the um, branches, particularly rotten, rot, uh, rot, rotting branches and uh, logs and things, if you look with a hand lens, you may see some little black things that look a bit like this um, on the logs. And they are very microscopic. So things like this are usually about 200 to 300 micrometers high. Um, so not something that you normally just see walking along, but if you, if you um, use a ha little hand lens um, and have a look, then you might see some, particularly up in Queensland. So this is a really simplified um, tree of the, of the fungi. So as I said, the basidium isetes um, we're going to be really familiar with, ascomycetes possibly. Um, then you've got the zygomycetes. Now they're not a whole um, phylum, but they, they're um, probably a group of um, a number of different phyla, but they're not properly um, sorted out yet. So we just lump them into the zygomycetes for the moment. Um, then we've got the glomeromycota, which are the mycorrhizae. These are the um, fascinating little fungi that attach to plant roots um, and help to help the, the plants to grow and then, um, then get um, energy back from the plants. Um, some really interesting little organisms. These all, all used to be grouped in together called the chytrids, but they've been um, based on DNA sequence data. They have been split out into three different phyla. Um, they generally look like this. You wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily really see them. Um, they're microscopic again. They're really amazing that they've got these um, little flagella um, on their spores. So they, they can swim through the water to attach to, to new substrates. Um, and then you've got the microsporidia, which are a fairly new addition to the fungi. Um, these always used to be considered protists, um, but they're now um, firmly within the fungi. Um, but they are um, pretty much exclusively um, parasites in uh, vertebrates. So um, each of these um, different phyla will be represented in marine and freshwater habitats. Um, the, these, these guys here, um, they uh, parasitize dolphins and all sorts of other vertebrates. Um, the chytrids um, here are really, um, we're, we're starting to understand a lot more about um, how they interact with plankton in marine um, ecosystems in particular. Um, but the ones that we're probably, um, well, we are definitely, uh, that we know a whole lot more of is this group called the Ascomycota or the Ascomycetes. And these are the guys that I most, mostly focus on as well. So the Ascomycetes, um, so they produce or can produce both sexual structures and asexual structures. So this is um, very basically what um, the different sexual structures could look like. This is like these little pear-shaped structures. 
as I said, they're about 200 to 300 micrometers high usually. Sometimes they'll have a big long neck. Um, but what happens is they form um, these assi um, within this pear-like structure called a perithecium. And within that ascus um, are the little um, sexual spores um, produced there. And when they're mature, they'll, they'll be forced out, um, out the top there and released into the water. Um, and this is a little diagram here of an ascus with its little spores. Um, now, the other main type of, um, um, as of ascomycete sexual structure is what we call apothecia. And similarly, they do have um, an ascus and the spores forming within an ascus, but you can see that it's a more open structure like this. It's not folded over. And then you've got um, two main forms of the asexual structures that we quite often see in freshwater and marine habitats. Um, so um, the first type here is a coelomycete. So these little cells here will produce um, little asexual spores or what we call conidia. Um, whereas hyphomycete um, will produce a conidia four that um, can look like this. So they've got all kinds of different shapes and sizes and things. Um, but um, they'll produce, they'll also produce asexual spores called conidia. So what are marine and freshwater fungi? So um, as I said, they're mostly ascomycetes and their animorphs, um, hyphomycetes and coelomycetes. Um, we, as I said, we see chytrids as well. We, um, we do see basidiomycetes. Um, but you wouldn't you wouldn't really see a big mushroom or something floating around. Um, we we see um, sometimes the asexual structures of basidiomycetes, and really rarely we'll see their sexual structures. But they're very very small. Um, you wouldn't see just a big mushroom. Um, mostly what we see them doing is decomposing um, organic substrates like wood and leaves and roots and stems. So pretty much any um, organic material that falls into the water, uh, fungi will get straight in there and start um, digesting them. But we also see in um, aquatic habitats um, that fungi can be pathogens of plants and also algae. Um, they can also be pathogens of animals. Um, we see endophytes, so these are the little fungi that live inside stems and leaves of plants and um, have many benefits. It's a um, mutualism between the, the fungus and the plant. Um, we also see freshwater and some marine lichens, uh, mycorrhizae, and they are just everywhere. So every single plant, animal, um, everything, everything that you see in, a, in an aquatic system um, will have fungi associated with it. Um, now, mostly what we find is that, um, so the marine species are really distinctive. You don't find marine species um, on land in terrestrial habitats. Um, sometimes you see freshwater species. Um, there's a bit of an overlap between freshwater species and um, those on land, um, but uh, not usually. Usually they are quite um, well adapted for their particular habitat. And again, sometimes you see some crossover between marine and freshwater habitats. Um, so some species can um, occur in both, but mostly not. Most, most of them are specialised. Um, so this is uh, how I used to, used to um, sample. That's my son sitting at the top of my kayak there. He wouldn't fit there now. He's 14. Um, but that's that was actually a really good way of sampling because he'd reach down from the kayak and pull up bits of wood and leaves for me. It was handy. Um, so how do you study uh, marine and freshwater fungi? Um, some of them, as I said, you can see with a hand lens. Um, if you pick up a bit of wood in fresh from fresh water and scan it with a little hand lens or ma magnifying glass, um, you, you'll probably be able to see some fungi, uh, particularly in Queensland. Um, Mostly what I do, um, I don't really rely on being able to see them in the field. So what I usually do is I just collect bits of wood. I'm, I mostly study um, fungi on bits of wood. Um, so I just collect, um, say, 100, 100 from um, a few different sites. And then I bring those back to the lab. This is my home lab. Um, and I put them into sterile 
sterile sealed containers with um, a layer of moist tissue paper that I've sterilized on the bottom. Um, and after about two weeks, uh, fungi start to appear, these tiny little fungi start to appear and I'll get usually about three or four different species um, on each sample, um, sometimes up to sort of 10, 11, um, but usually around three or four species per branch. Um, and if I continue to incubate them for up to 12 months, so some of them will take sort of up to six, um, nine months to, um, to uh, appear. So what's happening with these things is when you take them out of the water, <clears throat> they recognise that they're drying out and they'll produce their reproductive structures basically to escape the drying out resource. So that's what we use. Um, that's That's really handy for us because then we can see the... The reproductive structures and um, and identify them from the, from those. So these are the microscopes that I use. Um, so to examine the samples, uh, I use a dissecting microscope. Um, and then um, when I find some um, tiny little structures uh, on the on the bit of wood, I'll then use some fine forceps to um, pick those off and put them onto a microscope slide with a drop of water. Um, and a cover slip, obviously, and then put it under the compound microscope um, for um, so that I can photograph and describe and, and have a good look at it. Um, a really important part of it also is um, I'll attempt to culture any of uh, the species that I find. Um, this is highly successful with freshwater fungi. They're pretty easy to culture. Um, usually about 70, 80% of them will grow happily in culture. Um, whereas um, the marine fungi are a bit more tricky. Um, I'm having quite a low success rate, unfortunately, with the marine fungi. I'm getting about a probably a 30 or 40% success rate. Um, and there's lots of different uh, media that I can use. Um, and uh, yeah, I need to play around a little bit more, I think, with, with trying to get a good medium for, for isolating them. Um, and also uh, sometimes what can happen is that they can get overgrown with um, bacteria. So we often add um, antibiotics to the agar to um, stop the bacterial overgrowth. But all I basically do is to um, pick off some of the structures and put it into a drop of sterile water um, and then transfer that to an agar plate um, and then let it sit there for overnight or sometimes up to sort of five days and then look at it again under the dissecting microscope and then I can pick off any of the spores that have germinated and put onto um, a, a fresh plate. Um, the next step is um, using those cultures. Um, I'll then extract the DNA. Um, that's pretty straightforward these days. Um, even an ecologist like me can, can do that. Um, I'll then uh, um, do PCR and sequencing. Um, there's six different genes that we try to target. Definitely um, the ITS and LSU, they're, they're um, barcoding regions, um, really important to get. And then, um, and then I'll undergo uh, undertake some phylogenetic analysis to put together a tree um, that looks something like this. And this is one that I did a couple of years ago. So Annabella australiensis, um, you can see clearly here, it's in a different group um, to everything else. And that, that was a new genus. Okay, so what do we find? Um, on decaying wooden leaves, um, find mostly parathesial ascomycetes. So if you remember at the beginning, the parathesial ones are the little pear-shaped ones. We see some apothecial ones. Um, those are the, the cup-shaped and hyphomycetes and coelomycetes, they were the asexual structures. Um, unfortunately, there's no book to, or no recent book, sorry, to the marine and freshwater fungi. Um, the taxonomic work is pretty much scattered all throughout the literature. So I've spent years um, gathering together uh, all of the papers that have ever been published on um, the different freshwater and marine fungi. And I have put together a database of, I think it's about two and a half thousand freshwater fungi across the world. And I think it's about, um, I think I'm up to eight, about 800 marine fungi across the world. Um, without that database, it'd be very difficult to identify them. 
Okay, so the history of marine mycology. Um, so there have been reports of marine fungi from around the mid 1800s, um, but only very um, scant sort of records and, and mentions in the literature. Um, the first comprehensive studies uh, were fungi on seaweed um, in the early 1900s, uh, but it wasn't until there was a really important paper by Barghorn and Linda um, uh, looked at fungi on wood in uh, marine systems and they they produced really quite a, a big um, manuscript um, out like showing most of the common um, marine fungi and this attracted um, uh, more work from from other scientists who were interested in them so um, that paper was then followed by um, Wilson Myers um, Johnson and Colmeyer so Jan Colmeyer um, he did write a book in published in 1979 which is the most recent um, real uh, book that you can use for, for identifying these. So that was quite a while ago. Um, and then Gareth Jones and um, Kevin Hyde um, came in um, and, and has, they both did um, a lot of work on the marine fungi. And these are the sorts of things that um, you can find. These are some, this is from the um, Barghorn and Linda um, manuscript that I was talking about. And so you can see here some of their drawings. Oh, where's my cursor gone? There's, there it is. Um, so this is the, a paratheseum, the little pear-shaped structure, um, and uh, one of the spores, and the spores are, are born within um, an ascus like this. And here again, um, there's the little paratheseum, its ascus, and these um, lovely little spores with um, appendages at the end. And then um, this is a page of some of the asexual structures that you can find. And you, we quite often find these... Um, twisted up uh, helicoid uh, canidia. So um, in Queensland, you're actually um, in prime marine fungi hunting spot in Australia. So crib and crib uh, in Queensland were the very first in the world to ever study uh, mangrove fungi. Um, and they published, uh, I think it was about 10 different papers um, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and described a number of new species. Uh, then in the 1980s and 1990s, um, Kevin Hyde, who would become my um, boss after this, um, my postdoc supervisor, uh, and uh, Jan Kohlmeier and Volkman Kohlmeier um, were also um, active in Australia in the 1990s. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of um, research in marine fungi since then. Um, the most recent uh, study was uh, I collected a whole lot of um, samples back in 2014 uh, and I published that a couple of years ago and that was um, uh, uh, I, from all around South Australia. I collected from a number of um, mangrove sites um, and found uh, a number of different species um, and I put together a checklist. So currently there are 130 species um, recorded in um, Australia, um, but we know that this is a vast underestimate. So we, um, every time I look at the marine fungal samples, I, I see things that haven't been recorded before. Um, we see in marine fung in marine systems, we mostly see the sexual forms, um, but we do see some of the asexual forms as well. It's just that we mostly see these type of structures here. Um, and there are three basidium isetes um, recorded from marine habitats. So this is a study I was talking about. Um, this was funded by the Field Naturalist Society um, Lurabenda Fund. I found 43 different species of marine fungi um, around South Australia, and only one of them had previously been seen in South Australia before. Um, six of them are new species, but what's always frustrating is that it's always the rare ones um, that are new, and uh, it, it, uh, there was not just not enough material of them to, for, to provide an adequate description. Um, so this needs some further work. There's clearly a whole lot more species out there that we just don't know about. Um, there are um, 14 new records for Australia um, from this study. Um, again, mostly sexual ascomycetes, um, mostly parathesial. Um, there was one um, apothecial, so the cup shaped. Um, and these were the five most common species. And I'll just show you some pretty pictures of some of those. 
So this is uh, Leptospheria australiensis. Um, there's a bit of contention around uh, whether or not this is one species or two species. Um, I think up in Queensland you have one species and I think down here we probably have a, a separate species, but we, um, we need to do some DNA sequencing to resolve that, I think. So looking through the um, compound microscope, this is what I'd see. So this is a bit of wood down here. And these are the little necks of the parathesia poking up through here. And the, the bulb of the parathesium will be in, inside the wood. Um, and when, um, uh, when they're ripe, when they're ready, um, the spores come out here. And when I dig one out and put it under the compound microscope, this is what it look like. So this is the sort of bulb part here where the spores are formed and they come up through the neck and out there. Um, this is what the assay look like and um, one of the tiny little spores. Um, another one, um, I see this one really quite often. It's one of my old friends. Um, again, you can see the little necks of the parathesia there um, and ascus there with the spores forming in there and the, the pretty little spores there. This one here I see really commonly. Um, the, the little bulb of the parathesium um, will tend to sit on top of the wood, um, sometimes buried, but um, usually just on top there with the necks poking up like that. And they have really distinctive um, fusiform shaped um, assai and the little ascospores there. Um, this one here could also possibly be um, a separate species to, to Samoyeza uh, grandispora. Um, sorry, I've left Lulworthia there. It's, it's only just been put into um, this new genus here, but I think it all sort of still needs a bit of sorting out because I think what we have here in Australia may not actually be this species. But thankfully, um, I collected about six months ago and I now have five different cultures of this. So I'll, um, I'll be sequencing that and comparing with um, previous sequences to make to just to check um, whether or not we've got the same species. Um, and this is what it'll look like. Uh, where's my cursor there? Um, so these are the little bulbs here. You can see that's where the assay form. And it has these really lovely, um, really long um, filamentous spores. So they're about um, 500 micrometers or 0.5 of a millimeter long. So for these sort of fungi, that's, that's huge. Um, and another old favorite, um, when I see this one, I quite like it. Um, uh, little necks there. Um, these spores here, um, these little hamate um, appendages, you can see it's starting to spread out just there. They, when you put them into water, the spores, sorry, the appendages um, spread out into a long filament um, so that they can attach to um, uh, new substrates. Um, this is one that I found down in um, mangrove habitats in South Australia. This is um, Annabella australiensis, um, and it's a tiny, tiny little thing. It looked parathesial, so that there to me looked like it was parathesial, so it had me really confused for quite a long time until um, I did the um, DNA sequencing and compared it and found that actually it was in a group um, very, very different. And it's um, in, in with apothecial um, ascomycetes. Um, so you can see there, it's actually um, opened up there. It's quite different to uh, it's quite different to the parathesial um, structures, and that's what its assay look like, and its spores just there. Oh, and I showed this one earlier as well. That's where Annabella um, australiensis um, uh, came out in this um, in this tree. Okay, so the freshwater fungi. Um, these are really important decomposers of organic matter. Um, they can be lichens, endophytes, mycorrhizae, um, chytrids that parasitize algae, um, animal pathogens, and plant pathogens. Um, so the history, brief, very brief history of the freshwater fungi. Um, back in the 1880s, Sparrow and Hartig uh, first uh, described the first aquatic hyphomycetes um, and Phillips uh, in 1888 um, did a revision of uh, Vibrissia species so these are some little apothecial things um, they're quite common in freshwater I don't see them much in South Australia um, but they're common um, particularly in Victoria 
Um, and then uh, De Wildman um, described uh, four new fungal species from decaying leaves in ponds. And then um, uh, Ingold came along, Professor Ingold came along in 1942 and discovered 10 more species. And he was a prolific um, writer. He described a number of um, new species after that as well. He, he really opened up the field of freshwater fungi. Uh, most of the work has been done on um, fungi on decaying leaves um, and their hyphomycetes, um, but I don't work on those. I work on uh, wood. Um, and so we mostly see the, uh, the sexual structures, so mostly parathesia. But these are the sorts of things that um, Ingold was working on, these helicoid structures, um, star-shaped, um, these tetraradiate um, structures like these. Um, they're very, uh, very variable um, spores. So freshwater fungi in Australia, unfortunately, there are very few studies. So Kevin Hyde and co-authors were active um, in Queensland as they were with the marine fungi um, in the 1990s. The vast majority of Australia's waterways have really not received even a cursory examination. Um, uh, in 2015, I did do a collection up in far north Queensland, which was lovely, um, and I'm still working on some of that some of that work. I'm about to publish some of those as new species. Um, this is one that I've already published. This was collected um, up in the Daintree. And so on a bit of wood here, you see under the dissecting microscope, you see these little, little pointy things. Um, these are the little pointy things. These are the canidia fours. And then these spectacular, beautiful um, canidia that uh, looks kind of like a squash frog in some angles it looks like a roast chicken um, and then it has these tiny little um, oh, where's my cursor ah that there we go um, and then it has all these tiny little micro canidia coming off of its toes as well um, I must admit this is probably my favorite species so far uh, another species that I'm about to publish is Kyanakita um, spitnolf um, and my my son thinks that this, this looks like the end of a lion's tail. So we're going to um, try and produce a, a name suitable um, for looking like a lion's tail. Sorry, I should have mentioned. So this is the canidia four, and these are the lovely little canidia that that are formed on the at the end of this canidia canidia four. Um, this is another common one um, up in Queensland, um, Janula uh, seychellensis. Um, this is a parathesium here, and you can see the spores here, the brown spores have these um, nice little pads on the end like that. Uh, another really common one, Savoriella lignicola. Um, and again, these um, lovely little spores um, uh, are always a, um, a delight when I come across them. Uh, this is one um, that I did some work on with um, Kevin Hyde. Uh, he initially collected that in Queensland, um, but the, over time the um, specimen, I think, uh, got lost. And so uh, he got me to go up to Queensland and do another collection, and we have published um, an epitype of, of that um, species. So the one that I collected is now, now the, the type that we'll refer to. Um, and so, again, you can see these little necks, um, and it has this really distinctive Sorry, this this here is the top of the ascus here, and so it's got these really this really distinctive ring around the top of the ascus. Um, just coming to the end now. Um, so I have just launched a new website um, called Freshwater and Marine Fungi Australia, and really um, the main uh, aim of it is to pr um, provide uh, up-to-date um, checklists for the freshwater and marine fungi um, and also uh, to put in future there'll be descriptions on there and images um, and hopefully some more information because I know that um, most people don't really know what freshwater and marine fungi are so I just want to make it a bit more accessible. Um, future directions. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, future directions. So my aim is to describe and map the distributions of marine and freshwater fungi across Australia. 
so that this will then allow other researchers like ecologists and, and other people to come in and study aquatic fungi um, because the taxonomy is quite inaccessible at the moment um, and make descriptions more accessible to public and other scientists. Um, I want to sequence all of the species so that we can compare with um, species that um, they find overseas and to um, expand our knowledge of their distribution I'll use um, some some uh, meta barcoding as well and then so I only study the the wood at the moment but um, there's so much more to study the leaves um, sea grasses all sorts of things that that need studying and wow. that's the end thank you very much Vanessa has some questions. Uh, Vanessa has four questions. Go ahead, Vanessa. Feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask them. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Hi, Sally. Hi. I hope you don't mind me asking um, four questions. No, no, not at all. Okay. Um, I noticed when you were talking, you called yourself an ecologist and not a mycologist. No, 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 definitely. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm definitely a mycologist. Right. Okay. First okay. and foremost, but um, under under the bracket of, um, under the heading of mycology, I probably uh, would have used to put myself as an ecologist, um, but now I'm more a, a, a taxonomist and um, systematist. Well, it's good to hear because a lot of my colleges have to multi class, multi -class yeah. you know, yeah. do, do different things. Um, my second question is um, you sort of um, hinted that uh, well, when you're talking about freshwater lichens, you put them in the decomposers as a decomposer. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, that was a no. Uh, definitely wouldn't do that. I must have misspoken there. Um, yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're not, no. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I sort of um, focus on lichens and I was thinking, hmm, is there something I don't know about? No, is that growing the water? I must <laughs> yeah. have misspoken there. No, that's okay. Um, do you know if anybody's looking at the lichens, oh, lichens, fungi that grow on things like shipwrecks, wooden shipwrecks? Not that I, not that I'm aware of. I think, um, I think I'm the only person in Australia looking at both the marine and freshwater um so uh possibly overseas i haven't heard of anyone doing it but uh there's not a lot of we we, we pretty much all know each other um because there's not not that many of us around the world as well because yeah. i thought uh, that'd be a really cool thing to get into yes yeah oh there's so much <laughs> and finally i was wondering about um have fungi been found in really really deep water like yes. around the black smokers and that sort of yes, thing. Yes, definitely. The hydrothermal vents. There's a whole range of um, really amazing fungi that are found down there. Um, that's not something I look at, but I'm seeing mm -hmm. a lot of papers um, finding those things. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. <laughs> um, Susie was asking, if we are to make a collection for you, how do we do this? Um, at the moment, I'm probably not really encouraging just making a collection for me. Um, in future, I might uh, I might request that. Um, but at the moment, I'm really just sort of working my way through some of the South Australian um, uh, uh, freshwater habitats, uh, and I need to do that kind of systematically. But there are um, yeah, there could be in future, particularly up in Queensland, where there have been things collected before that could be really useful. But it's really simple. Um, all, all you do is just pick up um, a decaying piece of wood uh, in, in freshwater or marine habitat. Um, uh, it has to be uh, clearly have been there for a while. So anything that's just clearly you know, like a fresh fresh branch that has fallen in the water um, isn't going to um, have a lot of fungi in it yet. Um, and similarly, if it's too far decayed, we don't see a lot of things popping up either. Um, so you sort of have to find that sort of middle ground. Um, we just um, pick it up um, and uh, take a section of it and put it into a Ziploc bag and label it. Um, and I take it back to the lab. Very good. That could add another level to our collecting in uh, mangroves where we don't often find a lot of stuff. I think Jean Page has a question as well too. Jean, did you want to ask that question? Hi. Yep. 
Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Hi, Sally. Um, just um, you mentioned mycorrhizal fungi uh, with fresh water, um, but I was just wondering: is has there been any mycorrhizal studies or fungi that's like related with seagrass? Yes, I think there is. Um, oh, it's scratching the back of my brain a little bit, but I do recall seeing a paper fairly recently on. We, we're, so the endophytes within um, seagrasses are quite well known, um, but I'm yep. pretty sure I saw a paper fairly recently on uh, the, some of the mycorrhizae on seagrasses. Wow, okay. Hmm. I always wondered. Yep, thank you. And from Eloise, hi Sally, I'm a budding mycologist, recent graduate, hey. super interested in mangrove fungi associations and fascinated with your work. I was wondering what you know about their role in mangrove population dynamics or conservation? Oh, I don't think that there's been much work on that. And I really wish that there was. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I can't really answer that one because I don't really know. Um, and I don't, I don't think that that research has been done. All right, I've got a comment from Dr. Diana Lemon here saying there was a big group at Portsmouth Polytechnic Uni, yes. did a lot of work on shipwrecks and marine fungi, but it, that was decades ago. I visited yeah. them when they were able to study Henry VIII's ship, the Mary Rose. Not sure right. anyone does that work there anymore, which would be a shame. Yeah, wow. That would have been Gareth Jones. Um, he's now about 83, 84, um, and I'm in contact with him. Um, yeah, he's sort of my grandfather, um, uh, supervisor. So he supervised Kevin Hyde, who then um, supervised me as a postdoc in Hong Kong. Are there any questions from the floor? Very interesting. Thanks, Sally, for sharing info with us from Roz in Western Australia. So we're coming from all over the place and to say thank you very much. That was fascinating stuff. Thank I'm fascinated and frustrated that we can't do more in this space to add value to what you are doing. Yeah, well, um, or that there, we can't there would ourselves be. collect or process these sorts of fungi, could we? Yes, you could. Um, particularly, so now that I've got the website up, um, and I'm going to start adding descriptions to that, um, that should make it a lot more accessible. Um, what if the main thing is you have access to a dissecting microscope and a compound microscope, and if you've got those, um, you can get started looking at these. Awesome. And I'm more than happy to help anyone who um who would like to look at them that's that's right. my whole aim wonderful thank you and jess mccabe has a question jess go ahead hello um fantastic talk sally that was really fascinating mm -hmm. um i have a just a quick question about uh estuarine sort of areas do you find a mix of marine and aquatic you know freshwater fungi taxa in those sort of um, you know, where the seawater and the freshwater mix, or is that yeah. just something completely different? Yes, really interesting question. So that's, um, so years ago when I was working in Hong Kong, um, I was actually uh, a postdoc there and I was, uh, all of my field work was actually in Borneo, which was mm -hmm. amazing. And that was my main question. Um, this is why I started looking at both freshwater and marine is because I wanted to know in that um in that area between so you know when when it's sort of brackish water and not full seawater and not not fresh water um is it just a mix of the two or is there are there um, particular species that that can live in in that particular habitat and um, mostly it was just so some marine fungi um can tolerate being in some fresh water so fresher water so um yeah sort of the halfway between and likewise some of the freshwater fungi can sorry that's my cat um some of the freshwater fungi can tolerate some seawater um but also there were some species that only um lived in that particular habitat so it's a it's a bit of both okay cool um, thank you so much that's really interesting Thanks for that question, Jesse. I think the um the breakaway treatment for chytrid was um, application of pool salt into uh, freshwater environments, wasn't it? Oh wow! I thought that, and it was an Australian um, discovery that they found the breakaway treatment for chytrid was to introduce a bit of pool salt, well, just a little, not a lot, into okay. um freshwater environments, and it was saving amphibians because we know that chytrid was devastating. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's um. 
That's quite encouraging, actually. There's a number of studies out just this year looking at treatment for um, chytrid, um, but how to do it on a big scale is is the problem, I think. But you're more focused on wood substrate, um, aquatic yeah. fungi, rather than amphibian. Um, yeah, I'm, it's a personal interest, though. I'm yep. very, very much um, yeah interested in that one. We have a question on the floor from Richard. Just to follow up to Wayne and, and what you said before about taking the specimens out and putting them into a container, is yeah. that a, that's a step that we could do and then dry them out as collections or what would be the most, what's the most useful way of, of doing that um, as, a, as a dried specimen or could we just keep them fresh? Uh, it depends on the purpose. Yeah, yeah. So for someone like yourself to study later on, you said you can um, store them for a long time. So just putting them in a sterile container would be useful just to look at over time. Yes. So as soon as you put, the, as soon as you take them out of water um, and put them into that um, little box, they'll start producing um, uh, spores. They'll start producing um, different structures, and. The problem is if you just if you don't look at it, um, you'll miss a whole lot of things because they stop producing after a little while. Um, if you dry it and then try to rehydrate it and start it again, I'm not sure how that would go. That's actually something that I'm interested in because down here in South Australia, a lot of our creeks dry out. And so I would like to know how they cope with that. If it's terrestrial fungi getting in there um, when it's dry, drier, or whether it's, you know, whether or not they cope with that drying out. It's it's not something that we really know yet. But generally what I do is, is once I've taken it out of the water and put it into one of the little containers, I wouldn't then dry it to then try and do anything with it. I, I dry it at the end once I've got... Um, if I've got something really interesting that I want to keep as a herbarium specimen, then I'll dry the specimen with the, with the fungi on it so that I can then look at it later. Susie's asking, are there any fossils of these marine and freshwater fungi? Oh, good question. Um, I know that there are fossil fungi. Uh, I'm actually not sure if, I think I saw one recently in a paper, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not actually sure. I'll have to look at that one. Any other questions? I think we're all, oh, hang on. Thanks, Sally, for a really interesting presentation. I'm so pleased someone has been doing this work. There it was an attempt at UQ back in late 1970s, early 1980s to study marine fungi, fungi on mangrove wood in Moreton Bay. So it's great to know there's someone doing something in this space. Thank you so much, Sally, for your talk tonight. That was really, really, interesting and um You're very welcome inspiring to know that someone's doing the, the work in this area thank you yes indeed and there's a, a three of thank yous from everyone so thank you so much you're very welcome it was a pleasure right. thanks Ali. thank you, thank you.